So hello and welcome everyone to the Be Waste Wise webinar of the month. I am Akanksha Singh. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And uh, those of you who are joining the platform for the first time, let me give you a brief introduction on our organization. Uh, Be Waste Wise is a nonprofit organization to grow around the principles of uh, dialogue and diversity, addressing the need for uh, knowledge dissemination on waste management since 2013. It's been a decade that Be Waste Wise has been bridging the waste solution expertise gap worldwide. And we started off with uh, just one moderator in 2013, and now we have more than 12, uh, including Emma right now, who are coming from different parts of the world and society, and they're posing questions and teasing out insights and guiding conversations such as these that we've been holding every month, uh, which are more relevant to us than those in any other uh, online and offline platforms. Uh, we have more than 300 contributors as well who have taken part in this journey. If you see the value in making such diverse sustainability dialogues such as these available are free of charge to anyone and everyone, then uh, support us in our mission. Every donation helps us to create, curate and produce webinars on diverse topics. So we request you and encourage you all to do check out our website and donate. Uh, we will be sharing the link to the donation page over the chat as well. Uh, now, moving on to the discussion today, we have with us uh, Emma Berlo, who has been uh, one such moderator who has been very instrumental in guiding conversations and sharing insights for many years together now for our audiences. Emma is one of UK's leading specialists on circular economy and sustainability in business. She has worked directly with businesses on sustainability for more than 25 years now and founded Lighthouse Sustainability in 2020 to deliver impactful advice, coaching, and training. Today, Emma, along with the esteemed panel, uh, will educate the audience in the topics of remanufacturing with examples from around the world and across different sectors, and also see and discuss uh, with the panel and also with our audience how important it is to understand uh, what needs to, uh, you know, things required to happen and how best we can maximize a conversation around remanufacturing. Uh, to address the topic, uh, we today have on our panel uh, the Wanda, who is working as a, reg uh, as a circular economy and sustainability consultant, Elena, uh, who is a senior consultant from Oakton uh, Hollands, and Tracia Watson, who is a business analyst turned waste manager from Rethink Waste. Uh, before we proceed uh, to this exciting discussion, we would request you all to uh, know that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our website and YouTube channel. We request you all to use the Q&A function for all your queries to the panel and uh, use the chat function to share your insights, your opinions, your views, or anything related to the topic that you want to post to the panel that you can use the chat function for. Uh, we encourage you all to use this platform and uh, you know, pose as many queries as possible related to the topic for our panel to ensure we have a very comprehensive, constructive dialogue and discussion on the topic. Uh, if in case there are certain queries which are being not answered because of the constraint of time, we make sure that this is being guided to our panel later on and uh, they will be able to share the uh, responses as well. So back to the topic, Emma, uh, over to you. Oh, thank you, Akanksha. That's fantastic. And welcome, everybody. I'm pleased to say we've just gone over the 60 mark. So really great to see you all. I would encourage you to network in this session as well. So if you want to share your LinkedIn profiles, feel free to do that. Um, because, as, you know, as Akanksha was saying, this is as much about sharing our knowledge as it is uh, for those of you who are here to learn today. Uh, thank you to my panel for joining me this afternoon. Um, the Kanks has introduced me. I tend to do these webinars every quarter, and I've chosen the topic of remanufacturing because I think it's just not talked about enough. Um, and it's a fantastic opportunity that we're going to explore today. And I really wanted to educate the audience, whoever's here today from whatever background, with plenty of examples um, of remanufacturing across the world or from different sectors, and also to give an opinion the panel's opinion, uh, what needs to happen next and how we can maximize the conversation around remanufacturing. So it's not that sort of in the too hard pile of circular economy, it gets brought more into the mainstream. Um, so I think we're gonna kick off with a poll, Akanksha, is that okay? To get everybody engaged from the audience? Yeah. So we have a poll. 
that we're just going to put up next. And the question is very simple. Uh, what is remanufacturing? What does it mean to you? And we have four answers to choose from. Emma, can you give me one minute? I think there's some issue with the polls. I'll just oh, get back okay. to Yeah, no problem. Okay, in which case, uh, Tawanda, I'm going to come to you. Uh, in your own words, how do you describe remanufacturing to someone? I see remanufacturing as uh, a process or a set of processes that you would use to take a product back to at least its original performance or quality. Great. OK. And can you tell us a little bit more about your background? How have you come to under have that definition of remanufacturing? Yeah, absolutely. My background is within the automotive industry. I've worked as a product development engineer. I've worked within different uh, original equipment manufacturers or car makers, uh, as well as tier one suppliers. Um, okay. So my background is a lot more from the technical engineering side of things. Great, uh, brilliant, which is why we've got you here today. Okay, so Kanksha tells me the polls are working now. So we've heard from you to under in terms of what your uh, definition of remanufacturing, and let's hear from everybody else in the audience, because I've got a feeling it will vary. So if you're okay to launch the poll, fantastic. That looks a bit more familiar. So the poll is, uh, what is remanufacturing? Is it rebuilding of a product to a manufacturer's original specification? Is it renovating a product using new parts? Is it repairing a product back to useful condition? Or is it recycling of product parts? So we've got quite a battle going on there now. Um, about 30% of you have participated. So we'll give it another 30 seconds. Okay, it's a bit of a battle going on there across the four. I did think it would be mixed, which is why I've started with this actually. Okay, we've got 72% participation. Uh, that's usually around where we stop about 75. Oh, we're going 78, we might get to 80. But at the top one there, rebuilding of a product to a manufacturer's original specification, that aligns to under with the definition that you you gave us. Um, is that something that's commonly accepted in, in the automotive industry to under? Is that what how people understand manufacturing to be? Sorry, I think generally, yes, um, but the there's a bit of a sticking point when it comes to the original specification, um, because what that means is there's a higher level of testing and verification of the parts and products. Um, I think that kind of feeds into the differences between remanufacturing, repair, uh, or reuse. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, Trisha and, and Eleanor, your sort of definition, if you like, of remanufacturing, would you agree with Tawanda or would, is there something else you use? Eleanor, I know you you work in this on a consultancy basis. How do, how do you describe remanufacturing to people? Yeah, and I think I, I definitely agree with Tawanda and I just add on top of that really around the warranty side associated with remanufactured parts. We really expect to see that the warranty period matches that of new to really add that increased confidence and maybe separate it from a, a refurbishment side. But I do also recognize there's lots of nuances associated within the, the definition of remanufacturing. And through my work with the World Steel Association, that's definitely something we, we recognize across different sectors and different practitioners. Okay, okay. So we'll come on to some of that sort of where the knowledge and maybe the barriers are in a minute. Tricia, you're coming at this from a slightly different standpoint. What, what's your... Uh... How would you describe remanufacturing to somebody? Yeah, I'm, I'm coming at this from the waste angle. So I saw things coming into the waste sites that frankly were, some of them were still new in their packets. So we're still a, a little bit away from remanufacturing when we think it's okay to throw away brand new unused stuff. Um, I see it more as a continuum. Um, we try and put these definitions around recycling, repair, refurbish, remanufacture. It's all part of the same puzzle and it's the barriers are all the same background. We've got to design things to last. We've got to design components that are more standard, more repairable, more interchangeable. Um, and we've got to, to be more open to, to this 
terribly important thing that resources are limited. Carbon is stacking up in the atmosphere to prevent life on the planet and all of these things contribute to it. And we're not gonna to get to remanufacturing while we still have all these barriers in the way of the global supply chain, blah, blah, blah. Um, and when materials mm. are plentiful and people are all wanting cheap and easy, this is actually quite a hard thing to do. And we've got to get it integrated into the design cycle, just like Tawanda and Eleanor were saying, if it's not in at the design stage, then you're always playing catch up. Mm, great, okay. So I'm interested then, in um you know are we talking about this enough so i work in the field of circular economy as you as you guys on the panel do but it's actually quite unusual for this conversation to come up now that might vary uh eleanor i'm going to come to you because i know you work a lot in remanufacturing but you know the first thing that businesses come to me with questions about is recycling and then reuse and more recently repair so you know are we talking about this enough um do you think eleanor I think net zero is still a, a very new topic. And I think you have to go net zero to circular economy and then down to remanufacturing. Wow. I think it is really embedded within a lot of terminology. And But with that, there's no net zero without circular economy. And I think it will be increasingly a topic for not just net zero, but also risk uh, perception within businesses as well. Excellent. So I loved what you said there about we need to go... Sorry, could you repeat that? We need to go up to net zero and then back. Yeah, you've got to, you've got to start at your net zero, which is kind of a hot topic. Then, oh, well, how am I going to do that? Circularity. Well, then what does that actually mean for my business? All these different elements, including remanufacturing. It's, it's not an easy way to, to go, but you've got to kind of end up there eventually for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when I'm training in, in carbon and, and uh, climate, one of the things we talk about is, that we can't get to net zero without circular economy. And I think you're right, Eleanor, I think that is only just dawning on people, businesses, because we've been so focused on, and rightly so, on energy usage. And then we've been so focused on recycling um, and all these other elements, which are arguably are ahead in the, uh, higher in the waste hi hierarchy, have been ignored. I just saw a co comment in the, in the chat about, you know, costs and lead times. We focused on whatever is, the priority at the time now Eleanor what you're saying is as net zero becomes that not the priority but a key priority we're actually going to see elements like remanufacturing become more prevalent well yeah. we hope so we're going to have to right as Trisha said you know we've got to find these carbon savings somewhere uh to under I'm just interested in the work you do let's sort of sit around with this net zero discussion at the moment are industries that you're working with making the link between remanufacturing and net zero? I think at the moment, partly, uh, not enough though. I think at the moment, the main focus is, like you mentioned, around the decarbonization of existing processes without yes. looking at how can we do things in a new way to also help in reducing our emissions or waste within what we do. Okay, so, you know, this brings us to the kind of why aren't we talking about it? Is it too tricky? Uh, you know, is it too hard? Is it just too far away from people's kind of day-to-day -day work? I think it's, in many industries, I think it's because it's so different to how uh, we're used to operating. For example, if you look at remanufacturing across different uh, industrial uh, industries, for example, the aerospace is around 11% of remanufacturing. Whereas cars and rail are about 1%, <clears throat> which means fundamentally in that industry, there's something that makes it 10 times more efficient, more effective, or better to remanufacture than other industries. So I think learning a lot across how others do it, for example, the aerospace industry, uh, could benefit a lot. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, in the chat here, uh, Julia says, I'm interested in how we can maximize cross sector remanufacturing now trisha you're dealing or you're seeing the waste end the result of not enough remanufacturing arguably keeping things out of the waste uh, system you know do you think this is about cross-sector collaboration i mean at what level you know where does that cross-sector work have to start i'd go off a bit of a tangent i think it's uh 
we need to disrupt the whole system. And I think that co the, the pandemic has actually provided that impetus and has forced people to think differently. We had this massive interruption with supply chains where a whole car was sitting on a production line and waiting for one tiny part to come in from somewhere and it was stuck on a boat or whatever. And that in itself has made businesses realize this is actually a risk management strategy. To be more resilient, we need to take more ownership of our supply chains, of our parts, of our components. To start with, they were looking more at recycling. So you want to have your, your supply of, of metal and things. But I think it's now taken on a new level to, to actually consider we, we could get these parts back and, and use them. It's the, it, we've just got to get around the supply chain issues and storage and skills and all these other things that we constantly talk about in the repair refurb. So for me, it's more learning lessons along the whole supply chain, learning lessons from these other things that we are good at, the recycling, getting better at the, the repair and the refurb and translating those across. Mm, excellent. Thanks, Tricia. Eleanor, did you want to follow up on Tricia's point there? You know, where does this partnership start? And, you know, I feel like this is sort of very slow momentum. What are your thoughts in terms of working across the sectors that you're working in? Yeah, I, I actually, um, through my work with the World Steel Association, we bring together cross-sectoral remanufacturing practitioners and I think real tangible insights around solutions they may have found in the heavy machinery space for the reverse logistics of things that can be carried forward into automotive. There's so many interlinkages between both knowledge sharing, but also the process and operations themselves. I think it's it's no tricky thing. And sometimes people don't want to be the first to move. And that's where I really see policy being a significant driver to help, even if not directly remanufacturing, to encourage more circular practices that remanufacturing would then pose a, a solution as. Mm, interesting, your point there about sort of what you might see in sustainability as first mover advantage actually in something like remanufacturing because there's such a reliance on getting all of your ducks in a row you know and your stakeholder never mind your customer it's a much bigger challenge isn't it than say redesigning your packaging and launching it as a new kind of you know more sustainable product it's uh it's you know as, as going back to what you said trisha it's a much more involved system change type process Tawanda, I loved what you said and actually the comments in the chat that are coming through here are about trying to learn across different industries. So Paul from med medical devices. Um, I think we've got some comments about textiles as well. You know, um, how do we, you know, what is the knowledge gap here? Some of some of you are working in, in, with engineers. Are engineers getting taught about remanufacturing? Um, well, how are we, you know, how are we talking about it? But Twanda, what's your experience on the sort of knowledge, knowledge side? So on the knowledge side, specifically in the auto industry, um, I think a lot of this knowledge already exists to a large degree. You know, we manufacture parts the first time around, so we know how to make it, how to assemble it, how to disassemble it. So now it's just a case of, in my view, I put it simply, but it's a case of bringing used parts that are already in service back into this primary flow of resource, basically. Okay. Um, so it's about creating the systems, jobs, companies that we need in order to reinsert these parts back into production. Great, okay, so let's move into that. So I know Eleanor's got some experience of how you start to track those items. So once you've sold a, um, component or an engine or a laptop or whatever it might be Eleanor how do you work with you know manufacturers and indeed brands to start to say okay well when do we get when that gets to end of life how on earth do we get it back yeah and I think it, it goes into a much wider issue around um confidence in parts and remanufactured parts as a whole there isn't that transparency and visibility in how the product was made, what its full bill of materials is, and what the life it's had before it ends up at a remanufacturing site. Um, we spoke about it earlier, but understanding the, the increasing digital twin and digital, digitalization and tracking of, of parts and their lifetime really will allow that increased confidence in the information you have for when you're remanufacturing a part, and then hopefully the trust for the end consumer. 
Yeah, so Jamie's just come in on the chat there and said a big ba big barrier to remanufacture is safety cr critical components. These will have to have been certified, which is not a cheap or easy process, which will mean like for like parts can only be used um, as material strength condition, uh, plus the parts design intent must be man maintained. There's a lot there. Uh, Tawanda, how do you, um, you know, how do you uh, assure or guarantee safety critical components i mean obviously in automotive and aerospace that's absolutely critical before we even get to laptops and mobile phones how do you do that so to me that comes back to when we defined remanufacturing um mm -hmm. and ensuring that it is of the same or better quality as the part that is produced so obviously that involves a lot more validation you might test every single part instead of testing a batch of parts um, right. but it goes back to that difference again between remanufacturing, repair, or refurb, for example, because if you can guarantee that the performance, the quality is the same by the parts that you use, by the materials or the processes that you use, then that reduces the risk of the safety um, having mm. any effect. And in your opinion, Tawanda, do the processes and the knowledge to do that already exist? Or is that something that we need to develop? Yeah, so because we already do it in as part of primary production, you know, a lot of the test criteria, acceptance criteria, you know, quality checks and things like that, that knowledge exists somewhere within the supply chain. So it's about leveraging that knowledge that already exists um, and mm -hmm. to parts that aren't coming from primary sources, but actually coming from different suppliers. Absolutely. That's fascinating. Brilliant. Eleanor, did you want to come in there in terms of this sort of safety critical part? Because obviously cost, labour cost, potential delays in time are going to become barriers. And so how do we reassure industry that, as Tawanda was saying, these skills already or these processes that may already exist in their supply chain? And I think it's it's what we're already seeing through the extended producer responsibility. More often than not, it's it's your OEMs, it's your producers that have that knowledge of the testing. And third party remanufacturers are often trying to play catch up with that information. I think as legislation calls for increased rights to repair, maybe we'll end up eventually with rights to remanufacturing as well. But I think that's much more a business to business side. And overall, the industry doesn't have the demand yet from the consumer to really drive this this big change that we need to see for for growth of remanufacturing. Mm. Interesting. So it's this usual push me pull you, as Nick Trisha mentioned, the need for policy. I think it's come up again. Nicole is saying in Australia, strong barriers because of the standards that challenge remanufacturing. And I know we see that in medical as well. So there's sometimes there's a standard that actually specifies that a product must be new, you know, and you can't CE mark a reused or a remanufactured product for that specific use case. So it does, there are barriers to entry here. Um, I'm just really interested if an industry like aerospace and automotive can break through these barriers. Is it a case to wonder that, that it just never stopped happening in those industries? Or is it something that's become come in quite recently? So give us a little bit of a history on that. Yeah, I think oof, there's a, a lot that goes into it. But I mean, if you look historically, um, the transport sector automotive has been remanufacturing engines, chassis parts, um, and other parts you know, for a long, long time. Um, and there are quite a few remanufacturing businesses and organizations uh, in the EU and the UK, for example. Um, but actually what's tending to happen is as the materials and the designs of cars change, also this you know, reliance on either third parties or your own business doing the remanufacturing is less kind of important. And things like light weighting or things like increasing functionality of cars takes a front seat. And then things like remanufacturing, you know, we can just make another one if you need it, is kind of the default position. Yeah, and I think we see that in appliances as well. So there's been such a drive. This is all coming back to kind of what are the key motivations and drivers uh, you know, so if the key driver for something like a white goods has been to drive energy efficiency, which has been, you know, really successful through the energy ratings labeling scheme, and now to drive recyclability, 
um, you know, use of recycled content, that sort of thing. Those two things have been responded to by the manufacturers. But if you come to remanufacture the manufacturers, if you come to remanufacture that product, it's not designed for that good, for that purpose. So I think there is something here about um, about sort of going almost back to basics and you know, I hate to say it, but it's the waste hierarchy where we ought to be uh, looking. And there's a couple of examples been uh, added in the chat as well. Um, but really interesting to see, um, you know, Damien here says aerospace remanufacture um, has had no problem with stand, you know, standards. If you can get it right in a, in a system like that, I mean, space even, okay? Uh, I'm no expert, but I, I'm led to believe that rockets that go to space are not single use, right? So I know parts of them are, um, but that amount of kit, uh, you know, bits get reused and bits get, you know, I, several times. Latwanda, you might know more than me, but there are lots and lots of examples. We seem to have just sort of moved away from that and maybe it's because of other pressures um, that are on. Okay. Sorry, Emma, if I just quickly jump in there as well, I think you one do, yeah. difference with the uh, um, aerospace industry is actually, as you say, the size of the kit, the amount of you know mm. critical raw materials, steel required to make those parts, the energy intensity, it's it builds the business case more for the remanufacturing of those parts compared to, say, your automotive injectors, injectors which is more of a, a quantity basis rather than you know the size of the kit itself. Interesting. So is it just size, Eleanor? Is it a cost? You know, are things with sort of more critical, more, more materials going to become more likely to be remanufactured now? I think it comes EV with... EV batteries, for example? Yeah, well, let's not go down that route just yet. That's its, its own separate uh, webinar for sure. Yeah, but I think we'll do that, yeah. With your with your expensive kit, like they have within, say, the machinery plate space, that's, that's a CapEx investment at the end of the day. They want to keep their kit in use as long as possible from that financial perspective. It makes sense to them if they've built products around it, if they understand what's gone into the product and that it works for them. Why wouldn't they want to keep that in use for as long as possible if they know it works compared to, you know, white goods? If you're if your dishwasher breaks, chances are they're just going to shove in a new one. They're not going to bother repairing that kit because the value isn't seen in it. Yeah, we're seeing that a lot. And interesting, a comment just came in about that. The UK WE system, the waste electrical and electronic equipment system is historically driven recycling rather than reuse due to the complexity um, and then needing to generate um, recycling tonnage credits, basically data to satisfy the requirements. So really interesting, isn't it, that we're, we're sort of um, driven to do certain things by the data and the outputs that's required, be it, um, you know, the, the, the uh, standards that we have to work to or the um, regulations we have to comply to. So it's really important that we get the fundamentals right, isn't it? And, and those of us that are working in the space, even the language we use, um, and Nicole has said here about changing the language around, is it should be a circularity hierarchy, not a waste hierarchy, because we immediately define something as waste. It's lost to us as a resource, you know, sort of mentally. Um, I also, I, I don't want to get stuck too much on definitions, but I do think there is a lot there. So we haven't touched on, for example, um, product as a service type models or leasing models where you don't own the, the you know, the, 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 the original manufacturer owns the kit. So as you were saying, Eleanor, it's in their interest to keep that kit alive as long as possible and to get it back. And I know we're starting to see that with Philips and Siemens in the medical space. Have any of you got any other examples of companies that you are familiar with, Tricia, that are working you know, in this space? Yeah, I want to bring it a bit more down to, to the level that most of us understand. We can do the jokes about rocket science, but it's big, expensive, there's a lot of money in it, safety's key. Uh, there was an example in the chat that I wanted to, to pick up on because that's where I've got experience. Look at furniture, um, whether yeah. it's in your home or in an office. There was an amazing study done um, by the RSA a while ago about the great sofa recovery, and it's looking at the yeah. different manufacturing that's gone on over the years. An antique sofa can be recovered, re-sprung, et cetera, et cetera. It's expensive, but it was made to last and it was made to be redesigned and remanufactured over the centuries. Um, now you get one from a, I won't promote any individual 
slightly cheaper and uh, off the shelf shop product. They tried to take one of those apart. The material mm -hmm. stapled on, the wood is absolutely shabby quality. It was never made to be remanufactured. It was made to suit the consumerism, the fashion change and the price point that people expect. Um, but I think there's been some really good moves in the office furniture, particularly. There was one mentioned in here and there's one that I've come across as well. I think uh, in Wales, you've got Orange Box and I've come yeah. across Ripe Furniture, where it is designed to be. I'm not sure if their ownership model has gone completely down the lease approach yet, um, but they do. They design it knowing that it's going to come back to either change its style, to have bits added, bits taken off, to have the fabric change because of a, a, a change of branding or whatever. So it's built into their whole business model. These companies set up, they both started, I think, with office chairs, moved into desks. And I think Ripe in particular are now supporting the whole office refurbishment, even verging on interior design and construction principles. So it's learning this cross sector is absolutely crucial. And yeah, we can start at the high end and the, the, the big complex machinery business to business, um, but we can also get right in at the simple ones where there aren't regulations. A, a chair's fitness for purpose, does it work? You sit on it, mm. do the buttons to change the height work? It's a much more simplistic approach. And that has obviously proved to be cost effective because there's two or three businesses out there doing it really successfully and growing by the day. Mm, great so there are some examples coming in here uh laptops so uh one of my laptops is a is a re uh, well i would call it a refurb so that's interesting isn't it so what would fall off my tongue would be a refurb but apple sell reconditioned refurbed i guess remanufactured because they would need to meet the original um specifications uh you know uh, phones and laptops so that's quite a you know we don't seem to struggle with that at all you know it's quite a normal thing to to do um back market is refurbished here so again we're sort of trying to so it's a muddy area isn't it reuse repair refurb um i just wanted to you know how say you're working with an organization and they are recycling something like electronics and then they go then they move into repair of electronics they might add a service line it's a revenue stream for them arguably uh, greater job opportunities. How would you shift them, Eleanor, coming on this, um, from that position up to remanufacturing, that sort of even higher level? What would be the first steps you'd ask them to take, Eleanor? Um, I think that's that's quite a tricky question, but I think there's a lot out there in terms of remanufacturing. We've seen it through the chat. It's not a new topic. It's been going on for years and years. Understanding how that can work for your business mm. is the starting place. Circular computing, great example there. They have their own standards associated with the remanufacturing of their computers. They've got that confidence built into the product model. I'd also say remanufacturers love to chat about what they do. They love to share knowledge. So I think reaching out to relevant, you know, practitioners themselves, but also trade associations working on the topic. That's definitely where I think I'd start rather than going into the, the full operational just yet, seeing how that would work for you and how you see that fitting within your business model. Brilliant. Yeah, and I, I agree. You know, looking across industries, even just to work out where those kind of critical levers are, you know, what's it going to be in your industry that needs to change, um, you know, and, and then the design element. Tawanda, did you want to come in on that? You know, how do you move people up this circularity hierarchy, if you like? from re maybe even from recycling to reuse up to remanufacturing yeah i'm gonna uh, <clears throat> i'm gonna echo trisha's words as well because i think when we look at products especially complex products um we need to look across all of the options you know certain parts okay. of a product actually cannot be remanufactured and actually you'll need to recycle the materials again but i think yes. it's about building a methodology similar to what elena said just build a methodology to assess where you're going to target, where your highest environmental impact or economic impact parts are that you want to keep within your control or within your value chain. And then work backwards from there to understand where do you want to focus on, what do you need to change in your design or your operations to make sure that it works. Brilliant. So it sounds like, a, um, for me, some sort of materiality work, you know, sort of understanding where the opportunities are in maybe in your supply chain is it mapping is that where organizations have to start with sort of mapping out their what is it currently a linear process perhaps into a more circular one 
Yeah, I think that's an important part. And actually, when in my experience, when you start to do these maps, you start to understand where your data gaps and knowledge gaps as an organization are, because especially the more reliance that organizations have on suppliers, tier ones, tier twos, you kind of lose a lot of the information in terms of what exactly is in your product or how it's put together. So mapping mm -hmm. that out will highlight where you have gaps. And then once you have those, you can see exactly what circular strategy you want to apply to what mm -hmm. it is. So that brings me on to a question, actually, Todd. I wanted to ask about gaps because, you know, um, where's the where where are the you know significant gaps? If you walk into a business now, just in terms of your knowledge, what are they unlikely to know? Like, where are the, where do you see the most of those gaps coming from? Is it the legal side? Is it the material substrate? You know, where where's that coming? Where's the, the gaps mainly? I think a lot of it is. Uh... Elena pointed to it um, earlier, but for example, in the transport sector, once because of the business model, once uh, an OEM has sold the car and it's gone onto the second hand market or the third hand market, there's no visibility of where that car is when it comes to the end of its service, when it needs to, or it might need to have parts remanufactured. So understanding when these parts are going to be incoming, or at least predicting when they're going to be incoming, I think is a big gap and the big barrier today, particularly in the transport sector, to, to really blow it up with the Okay, okay, great. And and Elena or Tricia, uh, in your experience, where are the big knowledge or data gaps actually around moving towards re remanufacture? I'll come at it from the waste perspective. It's mm. totally linear. We see things at end of pipe. There's no the, the original manufacturer in a lot of cases of these basic consumer products coming away from the, the big um, transport infrastructure type stuff. You make it, you sell it, you want to sell another one. You don't give a stuff about what happens to it later because it really isn't your problem. Um, and I think that's where regulations are starting to finally recognise that. And that's where extended producer responsibility has come in. Suddenly, it's not the consumer and the waste authorities problem. It's going to be your problem because you're going to have to pay for whatever they have to do. And then it's in your interest to start talking to them to say, oh, bugger, how can I do this a bit easier? Um, how can I make it cheaper all round? Because it's now starting to impact my bottom line. And business in developed countries for the last number of decades has been focused on maximising profit, maximising throughput, bringing the price point down. So I think personally, we need to look at the regulatory angles to see where we can can push that we've talked about carbon as well the carbon tax on all waste is coming it's it's now going to hit the incineration market soon so a combination of that plus incinerate plus the um extended mm. producer responsibility you can't ignore it anymore as a producer you're going to have to start considering it so whether you're a big manufacturer or just a small producer it, it turn it into an opportunity don't wait for the regulations to hit you actually look now at what you can do um and and yeah take, take yeah, it on like the chin Look, and, and be the first mover <laughs> i like that you know take the opportunity it, it, eleanor did you just want to come in there on where you see the biggest data gaps i know you mentioned the sort of product passport but it seems like we're quite a long way away from that are we yeah i think um i think trish has just really really well summed up kind of what the big barriers are that we see around the data if it's not enforced by policy chances are companies aren't going to look to do it and actually the angle I'd like to put forward for this is, is the consumer focus on this. We put a lot on producers wanting to produce more and more. Well, that's because the consumers are demanding new things and they don't like the, the view of something being secondhand often, whether it be furniture or whether it be your car parts from a safety angle. Really increasing the awareness of consumers, of the benefit of it. You know, don't just take them, move yourself as a business to, to maximise the benefit. Be that educator to the consumers. You want this for this reason. This is the benefit for you. That's really what I see as a barrier to overcome within remanufacturing across a, a whole host of products. Yeah, I really like that because we do know, you know, we know that um, more than 60%, 70% in some surveys of people, you know, are looking for more sustainable products, are willing to pay more, but we seem to just be giving them different packaging options at the moment, not necessarily different product options. And I'm just going to come on to something that's in the Q&A here that says, um, would a simple would simple and clear communication to the consumer about the probable state of a product be enough um, so that the consumer takes some of the risk with the reduced price? So you get this when you buy seconds, don't you? 
um, you might buy a returned product and you're kind of uh, you're kind of taking a hit because you think well actually that's you know I'm getting it for half price I'll take the risk um, so is there something here about Eleanor to your point about changing consumer mindsets over kind of what's good enough I'm not talking about safety critical items but what you know Trisha mentioned furniture though you know what's what's good enough in terms of a remanufactured mm -hmm. uh, furniture and I think what's what's really interesting about that risk point is kind of circling back to the start, the whole point of remanufacturing is if you don't have the risk because it's as good, if not better, than a than a new part altogether. So you're not having that risk associated that you might have with a refurbished part. If it's got a warranty, whatever the product is, it's as good as new. It's just how people tend to frame it in their head. I think the framing is everything, isn't it? You know, sure. um, you, you, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot to be, we started talking originally about, you know, what's the history behind this? And I think there is a lot of the connotation about something being secondhand or reused, pre-loved, we sometimes call it now. But that's very much a reuse terminology, you know, and maybe we need to shift to a whole new vocabulary around remanufacturing. Because when you sit in a airplane for example you don't sit there and think oh crikey the engine's remanufactured trying to you know to come back to the point we made earlier those are sectors don't seem to have an issue with this so why do we have such an issue is it cosmetic is it psychological at the sort of consumer end has anyone got any thoughts on that uh Trando, are you gonna go yeah yeah i think it's a mix of all of those um, you know, a, a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, but mm -hmm. fundamentally, I think even our psychology towards consumerism and also how we deliver things that people need, you know, products and services, really starting to look at those all again um, and trying to find synergies across different industries also. Yeah, okay, yeah, great. Trisha, you're seeing the consumer end of this, aren't you, with, you know, from the waste sector. How do we reframe it for con consumers? I think you're on a whole different uh, set of issues there with behaviour change and marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've, as I say, developed this system where consumerism and disposability is king. We're a few enlightened consumers, and it is still a few, are aware of the, the issues this causes and the carbon cycle. We've now got a lot of people are being driven to it by necessity. A lot of the big industry does it because it's a price point thing. The cost of living crisis is real. I can't afford a new washing machine. I've got to get my old one repaired and I don't have an issue with that. And I never have done quite proud of saying it's, it's 10 years old or whatever. But I, I've never really been sucked into that consumer life cycle. That's probably why I went into the, the recycling industry and innovation in the first place. Um, so it's it's really getting the whole behavior change back to the circular economy. A load of people don't even know what it means, don't even think about it. They just buy what they want. They get it on hours and it's quicker. Uh, and all that whole thing needs to be unpicked. And that mm. massive disruption is yeah. something that we all need to participate in. <laughs> yeah, and it's something that I really wanted to unpick today. So, yeah, thank you for that. Because I do see remanufacturing in, as quite a siloed thing that suits certain industries, some of which we've talked about today. And then there's kind of everything else. <laughs> Can, well, I guess consumable items upwards to something that could be quite high value um, and potentially last a long time, but there's no chance you're gonna it can be remanufactured re because those loops just don't exist yet. Um, but I want to come on now to the, some of the more the opportunities and some of the social elements around this because I'm wondering whether if the drivers aren't enough in terms of carbon, if the drivers aren't enough in terms of the consumer. Would the social impact drivers be enough for some brands to look at this and to say, actually, remanufacturing could give us a lot of social impact? Anyone want to come in on that? About job creation. I'm Trisha. I'm taking a bit of a slightly different tangent. I can't can't ever have a webinar without my teddy bear and my re remanufactured bag hanging on the back of the chair here. Yeah. Um, it's an opportunity for partnerships and smaller businesses and non-profits to get hold of relatively cheap materials to do a different type of remanufacturer artistic re something or other that's why i don't get hung up on the definitions 
this this stuff behind me. It was a, a rebrand at a massive waste company, hundreds and thousands of jumpers, trousers, some still in the bags, not even used. They were going to be incinerated and I couldn't tolerate that. And I had a chat with a, it had to be a social enterprise because it's got to be somebody that, that's nimble and that's got different priorities. Um, and they used the whole thing as a training and refurbishment exercise, but using manufacturing principles. So because they had thousands of things that were the same, this is one of the very first teddy bears that was carefully handcrafted by somebody and stuffed with chopped up logos. Um, but they then went on to get patterns cut to minimize how much fabric was used using all those fashion principles, but on old bin men's jumpers, not on brand new fibers brought in from, from third world countries or whatever. Um, the, the, the bag was made out of old trousers. Those high vis strips are really useful when I'm wandering around my dark village at night. Um, but not quite going out with my high-vis trousers on. Um, and it's looking at things differently. How can we actually pull in these different strands? Bring those. We talked about skills earlier and the skills gaps, but we were still in the, the big mechanical world. This is real basic stuff. This is teaching people how they can work with what they've got, whether it's their own clothing through the repair angle and then coming in from there, or actually going into a structured environment. Um, this particular organization, brought people in who had been on the, the job center lists for many years. They had various issues that they just couldn't get into the work cycle. And this gave them a really low entry point to learn, relearn these skills, get used to being in that, that mm. environment again. So that that side of things, it's not the traditional thing that people think of as remanufacturing, but it's mm. using what's there. I saw somebody put in the comments about textiles. We need to use them as fabrics. Fiber to fiber is, is okay, but it's still really low end recycling. If you can actually take that piece of material and make it into something else, doesn't have to be the original thing, then it's still fulfilling that purpose and it's displacing virgin materials elsewhere. Yeah, great. So this whole, con this whole concept of displacing virgin materials has all of its own benefits, but actually the, what I'm hearing there is the skills development, the job creation, even the community cohesion you know we don't often talk about the social impact of circularity and I think that's something that I'm going to come more and more into you know webinars in the future because each of those loops if you like um, creates far more value and far more job opportunity now one of the things we haven't got time to explore today is how industry collaborates and creates those partnerships Tricia because I'm sure that was very hard work pulling that you know consortium together but uh, you know how do we um make that far far more commonplace uh there's a couple of people in the chat saying they can't see you uh trisha i think because you, you've got two screens but maybe hopefully they we've sorted that now um we're just going to come to our last poll we've got 10 minutes to go so um our last poll i can't sure if you could put that up is about what priorities we should have because i'm conscious we've we've covered quite a lot today um in your opinion, audience, where should we put our energy? What should our priorities be? Is it about design? Is that going to be enough? You know, if we just design products to remanufacture, do our consumers or even our B2B customers understand what are they going to need? Is it like to understand looking for opportunities, mapping out your process? You know, where's the opportunity for, for high value remanufacturing really going to pay off? And where do maybe products, you know, items just need to be recycled? Do we need to start to bring in biodiversity? We haven't even mentioned that word. You know, let's make a connection between nature and technical products, you know, the products that we, we have in our lives every day. Our really is remanufacture just another thing that's down the road and we just need to hit our carbon targets quick. Should we actually almost stay focused as we are in some appliances on energy reduction until we've maxed that out. There is a concern that there's too many things to go at, you know, so I'm trying to get us to concentrate down a little bit. Okay, so it's coming out with design, probably un un unsurprisingly, there's quite a lot in the chat about eco design um, and EPR and how that's gonna impact um, design. So, and then secondly, quite close, is supply chain opportunities. Any comments from the panel on, on what you think the priorities should be? Thanks everyone for that. I'll, um, I'll jump in there. So I think the design for remanufacturing we see is increasingly important, especially as we transition towards EV and more battery technology. 
I see supply chain opportunities to answer your earlier question, Emma, around um, what can people do? Contact your supply chain, get in touch both upstream and downstream, start talking about remanufacturing, see how they feel about it, see if there's a potential collaboration de-risking opportunity there for both of you. And, and for Paul or Carbon there with two votes, I just wanted to touch on a study that uh, Oak Dean Hollins did with CLEPA, which is an automotive trade association, mapping the potential impact of the remanufacturing market. And we found that um, just on a, a really simple material retention point of view, that the amount of carbon avoided from remanufactured products was that of 120,000 Europeans in one year. It has such significant impact and potential uh, also working, uh, and I'll put some links in the chat with the World Steel Association, looking on a product by product basis. Um, but there's a, a big VRP study that says remanufactured products save on average 80% of the carbon than that of a new product. So I think the carbon, the remanufacturing is the solution there if you're looking for ways to, to decarbonize your assets and, and your products. Wow, that, that's that in itself, Eleanor. I think just frames, we should have started with that, sort of frames this whole conversation because if you are looking at product A versus product B, what's the flavor of the moment carbon footprinting, right? So you look at product A and you go, oh, my, that one says 320 grams. Not that that means much to anyone. Oh, that one says 250 grams. I'll buy that one. Okay. Yeah. And so that's purely done on the product as is, a linear product. Okay. And what you're saying, Eleanor, is a remanufactured product could have. 80% lower footprint, so it could have 20%. Yeah. It's absolutely astounding that we're not leaning into it more. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so and I think that's where the, the knowledge and awareness of right. remanufacturing comes from. People don't see it as, as the solution it can be. You know, it kind of links back. You need remanufacturing a lot of, uh, in a lot of circumstances to get to that net zero approach. You need the, the circularity element of it. Wow, I feel a big shift coming on. You know, I feel a big sort of almost a kind of awakening, people going, wow, actually, this is where it's at. And we've been talking about this circular economy for such a long time. Um, yeah, who's going to sort of be first to move on it, I, I guess. When you're talking to businesses, um, you know, is this something on their horizon? I mean, outside of the examples you've given us to under. You know, is there general interest in this topic? People trying to to explore it? I think it's, yeah, the interest is increasing for sure because I think uh, the benefits or the opportunities that come with remanufacturing, I think are slowly becoming apparent to people, particularly, you know, some of the issues, supply chain issues, and even just scarcity of raw materials and risks to businesses and things like that. So I think it's becoming a bigger conversation. Mm, and I guess we just need to encourage that. And as an industry, as sustainability practitioners, you know, I think it's our role to uh, not just to challenge, but actually to encourage um, businesses and brands to think a little bit more ambitiously. So, you know, I often get asked the question about packaging or recycling. And, and, and you know, I, my, my first question always is, do you even need this? You know, uh, and and if, if, if you do need it, how can it be? Well, I will now start saying we've manufactured, but I would normally say reused. You see, so even my uh, terminology needs to needs to be refreshed. There's quite a lot of comments. Thank you to everybody in the chat about some of the um, regulations coming through. There was some conversation about plastic items as well, and I know there's a whole kind of world around plastics in terms of what can and can't be. Um, used or, or additives are needed and that sort of thing so thank you for everyone's questions and some of those we've tried to answer by uh, text as well as covering them here um just in the last two minutes guys i wanted to um ask you um what your key recommendation from today would be so uh trisha can i come to you to sort of wrap up your key reflections and, and what your one recommendation would be it's look around you in your home life, in your working life, wherever you are around the world. What are the materials available to what opportunities are there for you to actually bring in the, the social aspects are big to me. I've gone beyond circular. I'm donut economics now. We've got one planet and we've got a load of people falling down that hole in the middle. The, the cost of living crisis is real. It's now it's next door. It's, it's in my home. 
Um, so it's what can you do to address all those things by just thinking differently about what's there. Mm, fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you. Helena. Yeah, I think my my two key points were about, you know, continually that driving awareness, whether you go away yourselves today and do a bit of research, whether you start a conversation with someone in your supply chain about remanufacturing. I think that's definitely the place to start. It, it makes sense. So just spreading the word about it is really the key. And then I think the other one is about how we position remanufactured parts, not just the carbon saving not just the, the incoming resources gap and how it increases um, value retention of parts, but also de-risking your supply chain as well. It's so multifaceted. Let's not silo it in one solution area. Let's make sure the economic benefits there as well as the environmental. Brilliant, Fab. Thank you, Eleanor. And uh, Tawanda, what, what would your key recommendation be? I think with remanufacturing and kind of all of these circularity principles, I think it's about building partnerships. You know, these huge conglomerate one businesses look after everything. I think we know it doesn't work now, particularly with resource flows. So building partnerships um, and using existing knowledge. I think that's absolutely perfect. And I'm going to uh, bundle some of those together. And just to wrap up today, um, and my sort of takeaways are, are, exactly that point the knowledge already exists this is so common isn't it we don't have to reinvent things we just just use the knowledge that's there we have to look outside a different window maybe to find it and be open enough to say you know this could benefit both of us i think it was trisha that said about the win wins you know the social wins the cost saving wins and eleanor you you made the point a couple of times we haven't had time to explore it here but this is about de-risking as well and that's you know, that's pivotal to most businesses. If they don't want to do this for environmental or carbon reasons, then if nothing else, it's a, a, a huge way to de-risk your supply chain. And an 80% carbon, carbon saving, you know, I can't I can't get past that, uh, that point. So thank you to my panel. It's been a real whistle-stop hour. Hopefully those of you in the audience have, uh, have learned something today and have, uh, you know, got to hear some different perspectives. Thank you for all your uh, contributions in the chat. It's been flowing the whole time. I've struggled to sort of keep up with it and your, your great questions. I would encourage you all to reach out to each other and to collect, connect on LinkedIn. And uh, this video will be um, on the Be Wastewise website in a, in a couple of weeks. Apologies to those of you who can't see the lovely Trisha um, because of the, the view, but we had an issue with audio and video. Um, but thank you very much. Over to you, Akanksha. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, for moderating this very interesting topic. And I, as we all can see, there have been a lot of uh, information being passed on, shared on the chats. Thank you to the panel for taking time out and sharing their knowledge and experience with all of us. We are very glad we are able to capture such interesting opinions and voices and as diverse and contrary to each other as possible. And hopefully we are able to address our audience's uh, queries through this webinar. As uh, I mentioned earlier, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our website and on our YouTube channel. And if you like to stay updated on future events, then please do subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media. We'll be very happy to have your uh, opinions or your suggestions on more topics that you want us to uh, come up in this year. And uh, so, you know, because uh, we have Emma and we have many moderators uh, in panel who are able to help us uh, discuss this as diverse and, you know, as uh, contrary to each other on these panels on monthly basis. So we appreciate your time and effort. Thank you, Emma. And thank you to all the panelists. And thank you to the attendees. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.